everyone. It's nice to have everyone join us today um, for the first of, of what a, um, a small series of little um, webinars that we're doing um, through the Western Health Foundation, sharing with some of our supporters some of the activities that we've been up to over the last mm -hmm. seven or eight months, which has been a fairly um, unusual year for um, the health service in Australia or in the world. Um, so thanks to everybody for joining us today. And many of the people who are jumping online now are, are um, donors and supporters of Western Health and Western Health Foundation. And so thank you to you for your support and as well as for joining us today and showing your interest in, in the work that we're doing. Um, my name is Julia White. I'm the director of the foundation and it's nice to, to um, well, maybe not necessarily get face to face with you, but nice to be in front of you for probably the first time this year. I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're, well, on, on which Western Health is based, which is the Bunwaran and Wawarong people of the Kulin Nation, um, and extending our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, I'm really happy to be sharing a, such a, a fantastic group of really strong Western Health leaders with us today, and um, and we'll be hearing some some really interesting insights. And I hope that you. Uh, get some value out of out of the conversations that we have today. Uh, we've got about an hour long session. Um, we'll have um, all of your all of the um, the guest um, videos and microphones are turned off. So um, if you did want to ask something or shoot a question our way, you can either phone us on the number that was supplied with that email that came out, or you can uh, press the Q and A button that's in the bottom of the screen right in the middle there and post something there and we'll be monitoring that as that goes along. As we get towards the end of the webinar and um, after we have a bit of a conversation there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions and again that'll be through that Q&A um, button there if you just wanted to type something in and I know a couple of people have also submitted questions in advance and we've got those here as well to, to shoot through so thank you for that. Um, I'm not going to chat for too much longer instead I'm going to introduce our panel and, um, and hand it over to them to have a bit of a chat. We're really thrilled to have with us today, um, Russell Harrison, who's the Chief Executive of Western Health and very happy to have him on board. Uh, Dr. Marion Kaner, who is our Head of Infectious Diseases. Um, and Marion, uh, you know, incredibly fortuitously uh, joined us probably about six months before the beginning of 2020 and we're incredibly grateful that she did. Um, Shane Crow is part of our executive team and Shane heads up um, and Shane is our executive director of nursing and midwifery. And then Dr. Claire White is our consultant geriatrician and is the clinical services director in aged cancer and community and sorry and continuing care division within Western Health. Uh, I'm going to hand it over now to Sue Ellen. Sue um, is going to moderate and, and direct the conversation this afternoon. Uh, Sue Ellen Bruce is our Executive Director of People, Culture and Communication and has been an amazing source of support for all of the staff over the last uh, six to eight months. Well, and before that as well, uh, but especially in the last year. <laughs> uh, so Sue, over to you and thank you. And um, we'll, uh, we'll be back um, to take some questions soon. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Um, it's great to be here and welcome everybody. I think you'll enjoy today's session. Um, a little bit of background, I guess Western Health found itself in a pretty unique position in the middle of COVID, um, surrounded by a number of hotspot postcodes, which meant that even our staff who um, work in our health services were part of the community in those hotspots. And what it also meant is that um, Western Health was probably one of the health services, well, it was one of the health services most impacted by um, the second wave with, at the time, over 400 COVID positive patients admitted and also um, caring for 70 positive COVID patients in our ICUs. In addition to that, we actually saw that our team supported 28 aged care facilities and we'll hear a little bit more about that um, as we talk to our panel. So today our panel is going to share with you some of our insights and learnings. And um, I've heard the phrase a lot lately about it was like building a plane and flying it at the same time. And I think many of us um, that were uh, leading um, the COVID response at Western Health um, felt like that. Mm -hmm. So let's get started. And the um, uh, first question I wanted to ask was to ask Marion, you know, we started hearing the word coronavirus um, probably end of January. Maybe, Marion, you heard it earlier because you've got 
with sources all over the world. Um, but you've been in a similar position um, during the SARS outbreak. And so we want to hear from you. Did you feel this helped Western Health prepare for what was to come? Yep, so I've been familiar with coronavirus, both with SARS-CoV-1 back in 2002-2003, um, um, when I was actually in the United States at the Tennessee Department of Health and Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And so we had numerous cases of suspect SARS coronavirus. And so I was familiar with um, who was impacted, what the impact was on the, the hospitals, the infection control implications, et cetera. Um, and what needed to be done from a public health point of view to try and keep this under control. Similarly, the MERS coronavirus, which emerged in the Middle East, um, I've also dealt with, and I was actually supposed to be on a WHO consultancy to assist um, hospitals in Saudi Arabia um, with dealing with their MERS coronavirus outbreak until they found that I was not a US citizen and so could not evacuate me back to the United States. And so <laughs> I decided at that time, mm, no, I'm not going <laughs> to go over there. Um, but having um, experienced these coronaviruses um, outbreaks in the past or being um, involved in those, and also with influenza pandemic planning, the H5 in, um, with regards to H5N1 influenza pandemic planning, as well as the um, H1N1 influenza back in 2009, really made me familiar with the overall potential scope and impact that this could have on our hospital, our healthcare system, and the broader society um, in general. And so um, it also has made me very humble. Um, one cannot make assumptions. One has to be extraordinarily flexible and adaptable to new situations. And um, science really, really matters. Leadership, um, listening to science and evidence and making evidence-based decision makes a tremendous difference. And I think we can really see that here in Australia compared to, for example, the United States, what's happening over there. Thanks, thanks, Marion, that's great. And, and Russell, I guess that, um, if I throw the question to you, um, Marion was talking about a rapidly evolving situation, and, and I think that was the other term that we heard probably twice a day. So as CEO, what did that mean to you and what did you do? <laughs> yeah, I think dynamic was the word that we used always. And at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, you'd go through several changes in the evidence at that point of the, the guidance, particularly in the early days in March. I, I think as a CEO, we, I had a responsibility to make sure our people were as safe as they can be, that we can continue to support our community. So um, as Marion said, the world had a couple of mini pandemics before that we've had to sort of build plans. And anyone that knows health services knows we have an awful lot of plans. Um, so I took a team offline of experts. Marion was part of that. Shane gave us some nurses. We had some operational managers. And they started to go through all of the plans with that very um, fast-moving evidence and start to say, what do we need and how do we do it? And what will that mean for Western Health if A, B or C happens? And we started to get into some scenario planning around how we would meet um, you know, need for healthcare, I guess, and what we would have to you know, change in our practice. And that group continued to meet from February and still meets now. And um, we add extra people to it as we go. Um, you know, we've had a lot of infection prevention resources there. We've had a lot of infectious disease and operational and nursing resources to make sure that we can continue to support our community. Um, because whilst we've had COVID, we've also had lots of other things that people have going on in their lives, both good and bad, that we have to care for. So um, through COVID, we've had some of our busiest maternity months, for example, with huge numbers of babies being born. I think the record still stands at 579 a month, which was back in August. Um, but all the sort of usual things were still happening whilst we were also supporting our community. So I think the staff at Western have been great and very agile in, in meeting to what has been a very changeable environment, but actually getting on with it and providing great health care to the community. Um, so for me, that's been how we've dealt with it and how we've supported 
both our staff and our community with that regular communications and, and just collaborative working. Thanks, Russell. So, um, Claire, what about you? When we started to talk about um, uh, coronavirus and planning for it, I think that if my memory serves me well, you always had in the back of your mind concerns about what might happen in the aged care area. So tell us a little bit about what you were thinking in those early days in, in the first wave, I guess, in March. What were you thinking and what were you doing in preparation for aged care? Um, so it's interesting to, to think back to that time. It feels like 10 years ago now. <laughs> um, but I think in very close discussions with Marion, we were really intently watching things overseas. Uh, there was a number of concerning bits of information coming out from overseas about how this disease affected older people as well as older people in particular high-risk environments. So that immediately um, made us start to plan quite, quite heavily. Um, we knew that this was going to be a big challenge, I think, uh, should we get any kind of community spread within, within Melbourne. Um, we knew, I mean, and, and we have known for some time challenges existing in the residential aged care space. Um, and our teams have, you know, great familiarity with the facilities in our, in our catchment and existing relationships there. Um, and so we really started to build on, on those relationships and that existing knowledge on the ground um, to prepare our teams and to prepare for what, what might occur. I think we, we had some inkling that it could get really difficult in that space, but, you know, I think even in, in March, you know, we did have the best laid plans that got completely changed uh, quite quickly, <laughs> given the scale of, of what then subsequently happened. But certainly in that initial planning, Marion and I had a lot of quite early conversations about how, how this virus appeared to be behaving overseas in aged care environments. So I think I'd like to think we were onto it early. Um, and we started planning quite rapidly regarding how our outpatient teams and our inpatient teams would work together because we knew that it would be um, important for that to be a seamless transition in patient to outpatient and getting our teams ready. Great. Thanks, Claire. So, Shane, in the first way, were you thinking about aged care um, or did you have your thoughts on other things happening in, in the uh, acute system? Uh, well, Sue, so I have to say, probably during uh, the first wave, my uh, mind was very much probably looking at internally. So looking at uh, preparation of our intensive care and trying to, uh, put, to plan our workforce and how we might be able to um, you know, expand our intensive care units uh, significantly in terms of the number of beds and patients that we could, that we could take to, uh, to meet our an increased demand uh, due to COVID. Uh, we were also looking at um, uh, you know, upskilling our, our staff that work in, in uh, subacute and continuing care areas, uh, thinking that potentially uh, the, the complexity and the level of, of illness that, that the organisation might have, have uh, been exposed to might have meant that those, those uh, you know, uh, staff that work in rehabilitation um, or, um, or you know, geriatric evaluation and management areas may well have been uh, asked to take care of uh, patients that were more acutely unwell. So, so we were very much looking uh, at, at uh, very much looking and focusing in on trying to increase our internal capacity and capability to be able to, to meet the needs of the community. So, Thanks, Shane. And so then, um, Claire, if I flip back to you again, um, we push forward the calendar and we find those numbers um, spiralling um, in aged care um, during the second wave. Can you talk a little bit about, um, to the, our audience about, you know, some of the things that you had to help implement and, and then I'll probably get Shane to sort of um, uh, pitch in there as well. So, Claire? So our, our teams provided um, clinical uh, specialist care 
uh, for individuals in, in outbreaks. Um, so we sent in teams of specialist nurses and, and doctors um, to, to support uh, the, the existing staff in residential aged care. Um, and that meant that our small team uh, of, uh, of pre-COVID uh, nurses and doctors, that was about maybe eight or nine people to start with, was uh, uh, surged to, to become about over 70 staff that were participating in supporting multiple um, outbreaks. Uh, and at its peak, we were supporting 28 at one time, but I think it was a total of 39 from, from the start of the pandemic. Um, and it really was, was a, a kind of uh, escalating situation in July and August uh, predominantly. And that meant really redeploying lots of staff from other places who didn't necessarily, um, they might have had some aged care experience, but hadn't perhaps been doing this work for a period of time. Um, and we, we really had to escalate um, to increase the capacity um, in our teams. And so we, we split the teams into different um, SWAT teams um, with different team leaders. There was a big focus on, on safety for, for our staff and going into such an environment, which was quite um, unprecedented in the fact that it was, you know, external to Western Health. We had limited sort of control over what that environment might look like. So we had to really be ready for anything. And there were lots of things we learned along the way, um, but a, a, big, a big focus on safety for our staff. Um, and and we, we ended up taking on additional roles uh, as the crisis sort of went on in terms of, of coordinating and, and escalating other concerns. Um, so it was such a uh, big task in terms of coordinating an outbreak response at a particular facility and trying to really support the, the staff at that facility who were often very, very stressed and, and um, understaffed and, and really having difficulty managing the situation. And so our staff were performing lots of roles that they might not have otherwise uh, thought that they might have been doing. Um, and really, had, how did we sort of escalate um, concerns upward to, to people? So I think um, Shane and I found ourselves doing all sorts of things we wouldn't ordinarily <laughs> have gotten into. And conversations around logistics of, of waste management and PPE supply and oxygen um, uh, supply to facilities, which um, I think showed great depth of, of adaptation and, and um, pivoting to exactly what needed to be done, which I think um, demonstrated a lot of what Western is all about, really. Yeah, great. Thanks, Claire. So, Shane, so tell us a little bit more about, um, give us a couple of examples of maybe something you did that you never thought you would be doing as an executive director of nursing and midwifery? And, and what about some of the uh, nursing staff that you were potentially leading and asking them to go, um, you know, above and beyond in their work? Tell us a little bit about them as well. Sure. Um, well, I think uh, that the list is long, Sue, in terms of the things I didn't think that I would uh, be doing as an executive director of nursing and midwifery at Western Health. Um, uh, like it, it was, I suppose it became fairly clear um, fairly early on in wave two that there are a number of aged care facilities that uh, that were really struggling and, and that were really at risk um, in terms of of the impact that the that the uh, the pandemic and the um, and you know some of them had a, a lot of their staff that had to be put on leave uh, due to being exposed to 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 the virus. Um, others, um, yeah, were, were small facilities with small management teams and were really just feeling quite overwhelmed by by the um, by the whole situation. And so. So um, what we were asked to do on, on a number of occasions was uh, to actually uh, send some of our staff in as, um, as uh, you know, advisors on, on behalf of the, uh, the Aged Care um, Quality and Safety Commission to actually be able to help and support facilities to implement measures to ensure that infection control and prevention uh, practices were, were um, 
were, you know, uh, what they should be, as well as, uh, you know, just more general measures in terms of making sure that the level of care that was being provided to the residents within these facilities was, was appropriate and also uh, was of a high standard. Um, yeah, there, there's been one facility that we were actually asked to take over management of that facility as well. Um, and so, yeah, these are all things that at the, you know, the start of this year, I would not have predicted we, we would be doing um, uh, because, you know, uh, residential aged care isn't something that, that uh, is, is in the, the long list of things that Western Health does do. But, but certainly what I have found is that the, um, the, I suppose level of of willingness for for our staff and our our experts to to step up really see the the um, you know the need that, that our community uh, you know uh, had at that time and and really that they're uh, being part of that even though actually often it was a very challenging thing for them to undertake was actually, um, you know, there was no shortage of people who wanted to come forward and actually be part of that. And, and you know, they really, uh, you know, did an amazing job. Uh, I think, you know, another uh, situation as well, Sue, was um, that uh, you know, we were asked to help and support um, uh, testing within um, high density uh, housing uh, within some of the, the uh, suburbs that surround uh, Western Health. And so, so I remember talking to the team at the start of that and saying, we're not just here to test, we're here to actually you know, check the well-being and the health status of every single person within these buildings. And so, so the yes, the team went and knocked on every single door and undertook te uh, COVID testing for each of those uh, those residents, but they also made sure that they had food uh, in the in the uh, in the facility, that they um, had an income coming in, that they were well, and and it was actually amazing. There was hundreds and hundreds of referrals that came out of that process, where as a health service we could connect what was a very vulnerable community into services to make, to make sure that those people uh, were better off for their uh, for their interaction with Western Health. Yeah, thanks, Shane. That's great. And and Russell, I guess it felt like probably for us, but probably seemed like for the rest of the community that hospitals were just totally taken over by COVID. But you mentioned earlier in the beginning about, you know, we still had to run a hospital. You know, this was just part of another thing we had to do. So you mentioned about maternity services and the number of um, babies, but what, what other things did we still need to do and what other things did we implement to try and manage because many people didn't want to come to hospital either? Yeah, I think you're right, Sue. During the pandemic, hospitals have become very um, unpopular places to come and seek out care. And that's a huge concern to us collectively because there are patients in our community that are putting off coming for, um, you know, reasons that they're afraid, which we can understand, but they're not getting the care that they need. So part of our um, switch has been around going to telehealth. We've got a lot of people giving care at home now and remote monitoring. Um, to support those people that we know about. Um, we're also trying to continue to work with our general practitioner colleagues in community health to find, a bit like Shane was saying in his, his example, how do we find people that have got underlying health needs that aren't known to us and how do we support them? And I think that, that's been a particular challenge in the pandemic, but I think one to which we've risen to and our staff have really embraced. So we turned the tap on from doing almost no telehealth to having about 70 clinics on telehealth in a week. Um, which was a great effort from the staff and our patients and community to come to grips with, yeah, relatively new technology that we're all now very accustomed to. Um, you know, we've had staff going out to people's homes after a phone call to support discharges from wards or people that Shane was saying, where referrals have come from, we're not sure, we're getting there in under four hours. Um, so there's a lot of healthcare that's still happening, but I guess I'd, I'd make two points. One is that... Um, I feel really bad that we've, we haven't been able to provide the elective surgery. So that, that sort of procedure where people come in for operations, generally it's not an emergency. Um, we've been doing only urgents, which is the cancer work predominantly, but not a lot of anything else. So hips and knees, cataracts and things like that have sort of gone a little bit by the wayside as we close a lot of services down. So 
a lot of our community have been suffering of lack of access to those services, which we're starting to get back on now. But equally, I think it's it's been really heartening for me and I think the staff to see the amount of support the community provided to Western Health staff through the pandemic. Um, you know, we had donations of chocolate, we had surgical scrubs, face masks were being made, gowns were being made. Lots of people were donating food and just that sense of support from community was incredible at, at the time at which everyone was kind of pulling together. So I just wanted to sort of acknowledge that in amongst all the talk about how heroic health services were, I think the community have been incredible for the support they've given us and the understanding that, you know, you can't come into hospital and visit a loved one for any length of time. It has to be very shortened, if at all, in certain circumstances. So um, we've had great support from our community across the pandemic to equal what our staff have been doing. So for those community on, thank you hugely. And um, you know, please share that with all of your connections. Thanks, Russell. And I guess it's probably good to mention that um, our staff uh, voted this year, instead of having their um, Christmas lunch, that they would pay it forward and we made a donation to Food Bank to um, uh, provide Christmas meal for those less fortunate to us. And it was great to see the staff overwhelmingly vote to do that. So uh, it, was, it was great to see them acknowledge that the support they've had and pay it back, so it's great. Marion, so do we, are we all going to, you know, rest easy now and COVID's gone away um, and um, we'll never have another problem again? I am being facetious. You know I am, Mary. Um, <laughs> but but I, it's a bit like what does it look, for, look like for us for the next 12 months? You know, a, lot, a lot's changed. What are we going to keep? What, what needs to change about the way we do things moving forward? So we have had a really positive announcement a few weeks ago with regards to a vaccine and whilst early days yet that is, looks to be really promising. We still need to find some more information out, but hopefully that vaccine um, will assist us and our community to really revert much more to a normal lifestyle. Um, until we have herd immunity, um, so 70 to 80% of our population is immune, and hopefully that is via vaccine, um, we will not be able to go back completely to life as it was pre-COVID. Um, we have effectively eliminated community transmission in Victoria right now. We've gone 24 days of double zeros, so that is fantastic. And my hat just goes off to our community who has really saved our healthcare system. I mean, it's the actions of our community that has prevented us from um, being completely overwhelmed like health services are in the United States or in Europe right now. So I'm just extraordinarily grateful for that. Um, things which we have found out is that we know that masks really work. They make a big difference. Um, so that is really helpful information. They protect us, um, and in particular, they protect everybody else. Um, and so I think wearing of masks in uh, crowded places, especially indoors, is something which we will continue to do. I think we also have a much, much greater appreciation of that the outdoors is our friend, um, that the risk of infection is, you know, 20 times less if we are doing things outside than inside. Um, I think we'll also continue to have an appreciation of just the importance of physical distancing and the implications that has. So um, those are concepts which we will need to take forward until we have herd immunity, hopefully through a vaccine. Thanks, Marion. I'm, I'm gonna play a little bit um devil's advocate here, I've got my um, helpers giving me questions, a couple of questions that come through. And so on the back of you mentioning the vaccine, Marion, um, one of the questions is around, um, you know, it seems like a very short time to develop a vaccine. Um, do you think the announcement of these vaccines are actually realistic? And, you know, obviously they're positive, but are they realistic? What, what's your thoughts with your science, scientist hat on about those things? I had to say I was skeptical to start off with that we could get a vaccine this rapidly. Um, 
but and I've been watching this space very, very, very closely. And the um, four um, scientific papers have not been published. But we were hoping for just as a vaccine to start off with to have a efficacy of about 55, 60%. And to hear that there's an efficacy of 95%, even in those aged above 65, is extraordinarily promising, first up. And I think um, it's an enormous credit to science that we have been able to, as um, a um, as humans, be able to compress what normally would take five or six years into less than 12 months. Um, and so the data look really, really, really promising. The question just is how quickly can this be manufactured and distributed and um, put into people's arms? Because a vaccine only helps when it's actually put into people's arms. Um, it doesn't help when it's on the shelf. And there's complexities associated with the logistics of this. Um, the Pfizer vaccine requires extra, extra cold um, transportation and storage. Um, so that needs to be dealt with. And there's going to be two vaccine, two doses of vaccine. Um, so there's logistical challenges. Um, um, but it is extraordinarily promising. I just don't know the dates when that's going to be happening. But the fact that in the United States, they plan to probably roll this out, um, start rolling this out before the end of the year. Yeah. So that's extraordinary, an extraordinary achievement for mankind. Thanks, Marion. So, so vaccine um, gives us quite a bit of hope for the future. And, um, um, and if we can continue to manage and then follow that up with being able to roll out vaccine, we might find ourselves in a good place. But a couple of questions just which I'm going to throw probably to you, Claire, in a little in a way is that a couple of our donors have obviously had personal experiences of not being able to visit their family um, who are in aged care facilities. And so probably just a little bit of insight in why we do that um, might be helpful. And also, I guess, do you have some hope or insight that maybe some of the findings from the Royal Commission may help us manage a problem like this in an aged care facility in the future? So a couple of big questions for you. So I think just in terms of, of, of visitors and, and access um, of, of, for families as well as for older people to see their loved ones in residential aged care, I think, you know, at the start of the pandemic, we really knew that we had to reduce um, the numbers of people uh, visiting just in general and the, uh, the numbers uh, of, of, you know, and the risk of infected persons coming into contact with vulnerable older people. Um, and that was done in a, um, in a way that, we know now had a lot of harms associated with it as well. Um, it was and, and is still quite a difficult balance to strike. Um, I think having reflected on, on a lot of those decisions, um, which were made very high level and very, uh, very um, after a lot of thought, but I think there's, there's hope into the future that we can do visitation safely with the correct use of PPE and with better of, of knowing what we know now about how to manage this um, in, in a lot of the things that Marion was describing. I think we understand more about how that really affected families and older people. Um, and I have some hope that when, when we are having to face this issue again, we would do so with a little bit more of a balance towards open visitation and, and allowing access and, and supporting that access with increased services um, and increased resources to allow people to visit remotely much more than they were able to at the start. Um, so I think that certainly refocused our attention on the importance of visitation and, and access to, to loved ones and family. Um, with regards to the Royal Commission, I think, you know, before the pandemic, we knew that there were a lot of challenges in residential aged care. And, you know, it's just been 
distressing on, on a lot of levels to see how the pandemic has played out in Victoria, certainly. But I think, you know, that the virus itself continually shows us how it will find gaps in our care and the quality of care. And it will find gaps in, in equality of opportunity in healthcare and disadvantage. And it will nut out those, those areas where we know that people are vulnerable. Um, and it has done so for aged care. So I think if there's a silver lining to any of it, I think it has highlighted um, all of those quality of care issues and that there is now a much stronger um, focus on improvement um, when you look at the pandemic. And I think, you know, if I can see any silver lining, it's that. Uh, it will be very interesting to see what the response is to, to the report that comes out in February. I'm actually very hopeful that there will be changes um, because I think the community have really spoken. Um, and, you know, you, you know that a lot of people um, have been impacted by, by this. Um, and I think it's the future for, for a lot of families and, and, and ourselves as we get older that, you know, we have a lot of buy-in to make sure that quality of care is good. Thanks, Claire, for that. So if we, if we look to the future as well, with um, we're in a very fortunate position to be building a brand new Footscray Hospital and um, no doubt um, planning other facilities to come, including we're in, in, in the throes of hopefully finishing the new Sunshine ED um, February, March. So maybe I'll throw to you, Shane, initially, because I know you were the one who raised, uh, you know, what can we do before we build Footscray Hospital? Because we've learned some stuff about how to manage um, uh, COVID and infectious diseases. So what your what are your thoughts around that, Shane? Well, thanks, Sue. So I, I think um, firstly what we what we realized was that you know, uh, I suppose facilities that have been built in the past weren't really built around trying to control uh, a pandemic. And so there are a number of um, I suppose shortcomings in, in our um, current facilities that we really needed to you know, engineer a workaround to actually uh, be able to, to keep you know, our patients and the community and our staff safe uh, during, during uh, uh, you know, the, the pandemic. And so what we've been able to do was uh, run a process um, over the last couple of months where essentially um, your senior leaders and senior clinicians from across the organisation were, um, were invited to give um, yeah, their learnings and their um, considerations and, and I suppose their, their input into if, uh, it, you know, what's the key things that we would do differently in terms of designing new facilities um, going forward. And there was really quite a long list that was actually identified uh, from that process, and it's um, been really pleasing to see that the, the the learning from that has not only been able to to get, um, I suppose, you know, retrospectively uh, incorporated into the design for the sun, the new Sunshine uh, Hospital Emergency Department, but it's also been picked up by the new Footscray Hospital uh, project as well. And so, so yeah, so, so some examples of of um, of those include um, you know, our intensive care units. At the moment, we have fairly open intensive care units. And so in the new facilities, they will be you know, closed off by glass. So, so you're able to, to, um, you know, to you know, isolate people uh, fairly easily. You know, Marion's been very clear on uh, the way air, ha air is handled, and it's something that people don't uh, think about an awful lot. But um, but the different pressures that are utilised within within facilities and the amount of times uh, that an air, uh, that air is exchanged within a, a particular room, all of these type of things really are vitally important in terms of making a hospital facility pandemic proof and so they've been able to be built into those new facilities which I think will be uh, you know fantastic at being able to uh, you know, future proof uh, those facilities to meet the requirements of the community into the future. Thanks Shane and, and Russell from your perspective have you had to lobby hard to get some changes made and thought about? Oh I don't think we had to lobby hard to be honest um, I, as Shane said the 
the pandemic has caused us to rethink a few of you know, how facilities work and how patients and visitors can get in and out of hospitals safely and securely. And, um, you know, I think we were pushing at a fairly open door. It would have been pretty embarrassing for all of us to build a brand new facility that didn't learn any of the lessons of, you know, what we've been dealing with. So um, we had to push a little bit, but I was pleased to say that both government and Department of Health and others were very happy to hear our lessons learned. I think you started, Sue, by saying that, you know, we were probably the busiest health service in Wave 2 in Australia um, and therefore had a lot of um, good experiences about how we could improve things. And I think that was that was heard by government and, and department and actually they backed us and, you know, I think we benefited. They, and they backed it with real money. So, you know, we got almost just over half a million dollars to improve some of the flows at the ED at Sunshine, um, which is in development as we speak. Um, for Footscray, it's a lot easier because it's still on paper. So we've been you know, feeding those lessons into the design teams and they've been going, yep, yep, get that. So I think, you know, COVID has impacted the world very significantly. And I think it would be hard for us not to put those lessons in and get support. And to date, we've had that support, which is great. Thanks, Russell. So um, I'm going to um, thank you as a panel for um, your sharing your thoughts now, but I'm also going to now invite our guests um, to use the Q&A tool at the bottom of their screen um, to uh, send us any questions they might want us to put to you guys as the panel. So we'll make sure we can uh, manage the technology in doing that, and I'll give them a couple of minutes uh, to um, send some possible questions in. But one of them that came in earlier was from uh, Marcus, who isn't able to be here today, but asked a question about what has surprised you over the past seven months? So I might just randomly um, start with you, Russell. What surprised you most over the last seven months? I'm not sure it surprised me, but I think it's it reassured my faith in, in healthcare professionals generally and, and support staff in that no job was too great or small and everybody wanted to pitch in and help out. And I think that's a hallmark of healthcare staff the world over in that if there's a crisis or a call to arms, everybody runs to help. And I think, you know, it was reassuring to see that that still exists and the cam camaraderie between staff was incredible. You know, people change jobs overnight. Um, as Shane was saying, we were putting staff into private sector aged care facilities to help run and support patients. We had clinicians grappling with telehealth and, you know, it just happened. We had, you know, community staff became, you know, or certainly therapy staff, um, they couldn't provide therapy in the hospital, were providing it out of the hospital, or they were deliver delivering PPE supplies. Um, so everyone really pitched in and just got on with it. And I think, yeah, that, that was not surprising, but reassuring that nobody sort of said, no, no, not, not for me, I, I'm not going to play. Um, and I think that's a testament to the healthcare staff that support this community. Thanks, Russell. And a couple of questions have popped up. And so one of them is for you, Claire. And um, it's our board chair, Robin Batten, who's um, asked the question is, um, do you think we're better prepared? Should we have another outbreak in aged care? Uh, well, yes, thankfully I can say yes. I think we are better prepared, which um, is a huge relief to Shane and I and, and sort of to everyone involved. Look, I think it's, it's certainly still a, a huge challenge in, in environments like residential aged care, but there's been an extraordinary amount of work done in prevention for, for facilities. Um, I think with the understanding that um, preparing the staff, having great management plans um, and working with local health services, um, PPE training, uh, there's been a lot of work done with um, preventing staff moving across facilities, which is still in, in effect in Victoria, um, as well as really uh, testing outbreak management teams and plans across particular uh, facilities. Certainly within our catchment, um, there is, you know, quite an accumulated experience uh, amongst some of the bigger providers. Um, they've had direct experience that has 
um, fed into their their plan. So I would be quite confident in in some of some of the planning underway now. That's not to say it's not a huge challenge uh, into the future, and we're not constantly looking at our responses and Western Health's um, role in that response is is continuing to evolve with the Department of Health. Um, so, you know, I'm absolutely better prepared than we were, um, but uh, but still a work in progress. Thanks, Claire. And Marion, um, I'm going to throw this one to you because it's the curliest one. And so um, rub up your crystal ball because someone wants to know, and I'm, I'm sure we're all talking about it, do we expect to see a third wave? Um, I'm always a person who says plan for worst, hope for the best. And so I think we need to go and um, uh, make sure that we are capable of responding to a third wave. I think what's going to happen is very much dependent on what our community does. Um, this, you know, there are still some rules, um, and those rules are important to um, adhere to to ensure that um, as we get some introductions of cases, that they don't have aren't associated with major super spreading events that. Uh, able to overwhelm the contact tracing. And so I think um, everybody ensuring that the rules which have been put out by the health department yet adhere to is a really important piece to it. Um, I really hope we don't have a third wave. Um, I'm going to be really concerned once the weather changes and becomes cool and people go inside. Um, because that's inside is where a lot of transmission happens. But hopefully we will get the vaccine before that happens. And if people adhere to the rules, the chances of us having a third wave are greatly reduced. Great. Thanks, Mary. I think we'll, we're all sort of optimistic and hoping um, uh, that um, that's the case. And it really is up to all of us both as healthcare workers and health leaders and um, our community to work together. Um, I'll just ask one more. Shane, what surprised you in the last seven months? Uh, I, I suppose just build, building on what uh, Russell said, what surprised, like it, it didn't surprise me that, that our staff came forward and wanted to help. What did surprise me with uh, was how quickly and how agile we were able to be in terms of responding to, to things that were really rapidly occurring, but also you know, things that were happening out um, in our community that needed to be done really, really quickly. And if we didn't get on top of them really quickly, then it was going to have have a negative impact. And, and so so our um, and so we were doing things for the first time, but doing them really, really quickly and kind of you know, sending people out there. And, and we were you know, doing so responsibly. We were you know, making sure that our, our occupational health and safety people were keeping an eye on, on um, safety for our staff. But you know, Claire said earlier, yeah, we were sending you know, oxygen to facilities. We were sending PPE to other facilities that had run out. We were doing this type of thing just to really support um, uh, the wider community, uh, and and um, and it was yeah, it was amazing to really see everyone come together and really, you know, uh, know that it needed to happen, so they made it happen, and and uh, and it wasn't. Uh, I, I suppose you know all all bureaucracy was kind of uh, gone. There was just kind of uh, people were empowered empowered to make decisions and. And, uh, and, and, you know, those decisions, I reckon, for 99% of the time were actually really good value-add decisions that actually made a real difference. So, so probably that surprised me. Thanks, Shane. So um, we're just about at the end of our time. And so uh, my job is to thank the panel. But more importantly, there's a couple of people who specifically have written in some thanks. And so I particularly wanted to read them out. So... The first one is uh, Trish Raby, who um, some of us would know is one of our previous board directors. So she said, congratulations on the team's excellent management during what has been a difficult year and delighted to hear what's happening and that telehealth is working. So um, thanks, Trish. And uh, Robin Batten, our board chair, has asked me to particularly thank all of um, the panel um, for your informative session. 
Um, so I'm passing on her um, best wishes to you um, for representing us, I guess, in a good good light. And um, it is great for people to hear um, what we do because I, if there's anything I know about Western Health, it, we tend to be fairly humble as well. We just get on with it. So it is nice to actually get an opportunity to talk about some of our achievements, um, how effective we've been. And, and, you know, if I must say it, we've been pretty good, I would say, pretty great um, in how we've all pulled together and, and managed this in what was very tricky. So, so um, Julia, I don't know whether you want to say the final word from behalf of the foundation, but I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Sue, and look, thank you so much to all of the panel for your contributions. Um, the, the, the conversations that we've heard over the months, but to actually hear them um, collectively as a group, it's, it's fascinating just to gain an understanding, I suppose, of, of how well that, that leadership of Western Health has worked together to actually respond as a collective, which is really inspirational. Um, so thank you to all of you, and thank you very much to our attendees for joining us. Um, there were a couple of questions there we didn't get to, so we might, um, we'll jump online and, and um, answer those uh, when we post this online as well, just to make sure that all of those questions are addressed. The, the recording of this will be made available um, and we'll send out a, a web link to all donors to have a look at that as well. So thank you. And again, thanks very much for your help and support. Um, nice to see everybody. Thank you.